Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's been it's great to uh, join you uh, this morning. I have some interesting things, so take get a notepad and paper out. We're going to talk some uh, policy here, and of course, intertwined in our great states with politics as well. Sorry to say. Um, first of all, uh, a thank you to uh, to Wisarp and John. Good to see you. You are a stalwart figure in a rail and I've admired and worked with you for a long time and I'm happy to be part of this. Also um, uh, to a run, uh, thank you. Uh, he is a val very valuable uh, source for our state of Wisconsin of information and advocacy and we appreciate that um, very, very much. I wanna start out by thanking Wisarp for letting us uh, give the legislature the newsletters. Uh, and um, we have a number of people, these newsletters, by the way, are incredibly uh, well done and are very popular. And hats off to Mark and John and everybody else who's been involved in this for a long time. <clears throat> One of the very smartest legislators, and I'm talking smart, smart, uh, is a young man who is from the south side of Milwaukee, represents part of West Dallas, uh, his name is Representative Danny Reamer, and he is a sharp guy. And um, he asked me, stopped me in the hallway, this is a little while ago, and said that I read that newsletter from top to bottom. And I read it because it isn't, it is presented as an informational piece and it isn't flashy. And it's right there on one sheet of paper, black and white print with black and white pictures. And he really does like that newsletter. And I've had that comment from other people. So All Aboard Wisconsin distributes that newsletter every quarter to every member of the legislature and to the governor's office. And I just want to acknowledge the work that is done on it because it is a very valuable tool in the work that I do um, in, the, in the Capitol and all of us do in terms of advocacy. Secondly, I wanted you to know something about the governor of Minnesota and the governor of Wisconsin. They are friends. Uh, I did not realize that they knew each other as well as they, uh, as they did. Uh, they got to know each other, obviously, because um, the governor of Minnesota's congressional district bordered on part of Wisconsin as well. And so they, Governor Evers has said, if I have a question, I can pick up the phone and call the governor of Minnesota. We get along. And I said, well, that's because you're both under attack all the time. You know, <laughs> so you're comrades uh, by virtue of that. And then the third little piece of that is the emergence of Ron Kind in all of these issues. Um, Congressman Kind has uh, been around for a long time. Many of you know him. He represents La Crosse, but also Eau Claire. Um, Last year at the Democratic State Convention in Wisconsin, it was a virtual convention. And I like to watch those things. In fact, All Aboard Wisconsin has attended both the Republican and the Democratic conventions. Uh, we will, I'll convince Clark to come with me and have a drink at the bar. And we kind of watch the proceedings from time to time. Um, of all the speakers this year, last June, the only a uh, person that had a, a political sign behind them was Ron Kind. And it was a sign for Joe Biden, which is very unusual that a political personality would put somebody else's sign behind them. And afterwards, I asked him, I said, what was that all about? I didn't know. He said, I have a good personal relationship with, with Joe Biden. I got to know him during his uh, some of his uh, term in the Senate, and I got to know him as vice president. I really like him, and I really get along with him. In fact, he said he's patched up my relationship with Nancy Pelosi a little. Those of you who know Ron Kai know that he never supported Nancy Pelosi for speaker, and therefore doesn't have a staff of 30 people on a committee, right? So, um, but I find that interesting, and for our purposes, of connecting the rail service between our states. Those are important things for you to know just about in the back of the back of your mind that are useful to us. So I would use Ron's office, and I know many of you have worked with him, who uh, people up in Eau Claire, down John Bayou and La Crosse, and others have worked with him. 
Um, and then a couple, I'm just going to go through these points and then we'll get to the heart of the matter here in a second. Um, All Aboard Wisconsin uh, has, uh, we are registered to lobby. Um, so we get directly in the muck and mire uh, of the politics. And just folks know it's not peaches and cream anymore. Uh, it is pretty hardball uh, politics. We uh, supported the appointment of Craig Thompson, and we have registered in support of his. It is two years plus that he has been serving as acting secretary without a vote of the state Senate. The speaker that you had this morning, uh, Senator Paff, was actually our agricultural secretary. And the day the state Senate refused to confirm him, he was cut off of state service. His retirement, his health care ended when the vote did not uh, proceed with his appointment. And lo and behold, now, a year later, he is a state senator from that district, by a, albeit by a small margin. But he is Mr. Energy, as you can tell. He is uh, a go-getter. So we, we have actively been supporting Craig Thompson's appointment as a permanent secretary to this position. Um, uh, also, we did uh, an event that I, I, some of you are very aware of and some of you really helped with. And this was an eye-opener for me. Um, during the election on September 30th, we gathered together, all aboard Wisconsin, and I want to do a shout out to Andy Hauk, at, who's on the call from SMART, and, and his brothers and sisters in the uh, union and in the uh, rail unions were incredibly helpful in doing this. And we assembled uh, seven candidates, including local officials in Columbus. And we got on the train and we rode to, through Portage, and we ended up in Wisconsin Dells at the station and we walked up a few blocks to the public library and we had a forum about rail of those seven candidates locally six had never been on a passenger train it went right through their districts and they loved it we had terrible weather at the start but all of a sudden the skies cleared and there's this beautiful rainbows and it was an absolutely charming educational day. Andy Hauk arranged for uh, the Brotherhood to give us some hats. There were hats, there were stickers. We provided the newsletters. Uh, again, thank you, Wisarp. Um, and we had a great discussion. I was so encouraged by that uh, to realize that maybe we need to do more of that uh, with these new people. There are 24 new members of the legislature, and I would suspect of that 24 members this year, probably 20 of them have never been on the passenger train uh, that goes up to Minneapolis to see the countryside. The one interesting comment was from one of the legislators was, we got to build something in Portage. It's got to be more than a deck out front, you know? <laughs> so there was a lot of interest there. And of course the station in Wisconsin Dells is beautiful. I wanted to share those things with you because as I reflect back on the last six months, those are things that are very important. One other thing that we did at our legislative day, which we held recently, um, in all of our discussions in, in both states, uh, and uh, thanks to the DOT in Minnesota for being part of this, we have lost in Wisconsin uh, over 6,000 people to COVID-19. This has affected every mode of transportation um, very seriously and affected the health of so many people. Um, and we take it very seriously. We formed in our state a public transportation COVID-19 task force. And we met four times with DOT. The DOT staffed it and they allowed us to use their telephone service. Um, we have broadband issues here, just so you know, Western Minnesota, you're not alone. Um, and we presented the department with an award. And what the department did, what we did, we shared what we were experiencing in the field. And so this included more than passenger rail. We are united with other groups here in our state and that gives us extra strength. So people that provide uh, rides to medical appointments, what do you do at a nursing home when you're picking up someone for surgery 
what are the rules and procedures for your medical vehicle, your taxi cab, your shared ride? How many times can you use it? Can you put two passengers in? Guess what? You can't. Uh, and so we presented the department with an award for outstanding public service for working with us through the COVID-19. That award we presented and we made public on the day of Craig Thompson's a Senate hearing, uh, which was held uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and he really appreciated that. The word thank you is not often said anymore in politics. And so we wanted, we wanted to do that. So uh, get into some of this um, uh, current political thing and I'll stick to my time schedules. So in our state, we have a biennial budget. The budget numbers, and you can write these down, um, Eileen, you can memorize these, right? Senate Bill 111 and Assembly Bill 68. They are identical bills. They are 1,846 pages long. They are fun to read. They are very interesting to look at. Um, so our state budget was introduced on February 16th uh, and has now been in the process. Uh, and the legislature just announced that it is scrapping the entire governor's budget and starting over. So this 1,846 page document with all of its, it, the, uh, the, the two majority party leaders announced that they are starting from scratch. So any items that we support have to be put in to a document the items that were in the document by the governor will be taken out of the document. So it becomes the fate of this 16 member committee that we are gonna focus on here for a few minutes in regards to Senate Bill 111 and Assembly Bill 68. The Joint Committee on Finance, uh, and our friends from Minnesota knows this, knows this pretty well. Um, we have uh, a system by which there will be three public hearings. Our majority party is insisting that these meetings be in public and be in large gatherings. Uh, we, have, we have people, uh, especially in other northern parts of our state who believe this is just, this whole virus thing was just not very real. We have one legislator who stood up <clears throat> Thursday said he's never gonna take the vaccine and he's in his late 70s. Um, so the first one of these, and I think you're aware of this through the newsletters and publications, um, April 9th is in Whitewater, April 21st is in Rhinelander, and then on April 22nd, and I'm encouraging um, a lot of you who can do this, I will drive up to Menominee. The other thing I can share with you is there has been a decision made over the weekend that they will take up the Senate bill first. So there's joint bills, companion bills, but the action in will be in the state Senate in Wisconsin first. That works to our advantage in the situation of, let's just take T, TCMC. We have a state Senator from the Racine area who is a member of the Interstate Passenger Rail Commission. His name is Van Wangard, all right? We have a former state Senator who Luther Olson, who's been in there since before John Parkin was born, right? He'd been in there a long time, that he uh, has announced that he favors the proposal and he's no longer in the legislature, but his replacement is State Senator Balwig and she is open to this and her district goes, her Senate district includes the Dells and, uh, and part of that area. So, then, so they're going to do the bill in the Senate first. The Joint Finance Committee also announced the two members of the 16 committee member who will be in charge of transportation. So this gets narrowed down each time. The members are Terry Katzma, who is from Oostburg. For those of you who are Norwegian, know what Oostburg, you know, Westby, Osby, all those. Norwegian names, we have a lot of them, Terry Katzma, the former bank president, and Howard Markline, who's from Spring Green. Uh, Senator Markline is the chair of the Finance Committee. 
And the two of them have announced that they will be in charge of developing the final transportation package that will be given to both houses of the legislature. So the governor, they are the ones starting at zero. So we will address some of ours. Also, um, the, so we have to go to the public hearings and somebody has to testify at those for it to count. They are, they did give in to the Democrats who wanted to have some virtual access to this. And they allowed one virtual meeting, but you have to be there in person virtually. So you have to be like we are today, 50 some of you on the call, you have to wait till your turn, but you've got to be there. At least you're not in a gymnasium with 600 other people. Um, if, if, if you're recovering or if you've been infected, um, how do you testify? So um, they're also keeping things very close to the vest. So back years ago, the standing committees would have a say, there would be more public input. <clears throat> this, this budget under, under the current political situation, everything is held very close to the vest. So they are doing the budget development through the partisan caucuses. So the Senate Republican Caucus and the Assembly Republican Caucus, which do not have to follow any open meetings laws. They don't have to record any of their votes. They emerge with a package. So um, we have to work on that. So in the governor's budget <clears throat> is the $20 million for freight preservation. So that was the, the thing the governor put in his budget and it's bonding. It's less than what has been in there before, but that is now subject to review. That could not be in the budget, but that would be in there. And then there's the whole issue, for those of you who have followed this, please write this down. Last year, the Wisconsin Legislative Fiscal Bureau issued paper 723. Paper 723 explained <clears throat> the $45 million that Governor Evers proposed for passenger rail last year, which was whittled down to 35 million. And there was a provision in there that the state of Wisconsin could not, the DOT, the governor, could not spend the 35 million without the permission of the Fiscal Bureau, of the Finance Committee. The governor vetoed that part out, but they are still insisting that he has to come back to them, <clears throat> to these same people for any expansion of any dollars or grant money that we might receive. So we have to, uh, we have to look at this and as this federal grant, um, we have to be very respectful of the DOTs in both states and we have to devise a plan <clears throat> those of us that can are advocates and those of you that are citizen advocates, um, we have to devise a plan to win at the finance level and to get um, make to make sure that Wisconsin is able to meet its share of matching the dollars for this grant. And that is our task for April, May, June. So we have three months in which to do this. Also, it is possible that there is no budget in the state of Wisconsin and that these wranglings continue and get worse and worse. Our governor, based on, I'm just gonna explain one thing about COVID and why this really matters, because there is COVID money uh, in for transportation, as you might well suspect. At the federal level, President Trump <clears throat> the Republicans in the U.S. Senate tried to figure out a way <clears throat> to give uh, more flexibility to the red states than the blue states. And, uh, and so if you're a blue state governor and you have a red legislature, you want to make sure that it's imbalanced, right? But they couldn't figure out to do it because there are 25 blue governors and 25 red governors and they couldn't work it out. So the governors get the money <clears throat> and that's what they agreed to. So when these dollars come in, it's the governor who uh, puts, puts them out and awards the grants of, as people apply for them. So in our state, our legislature wants to take that power away from the governor and say, 
uh, that they do. And, and I was talking to one of the Republican legislators, Scott, from your area up in Eau Claire, and uh, she said, what's so unreasonable about that? And I said, you didn't meet for 300 days in a row. Why in the world are we going give to you, give you access to the federal money when you wouldn't deal with the pandemic in any sort of a reasonable way? And she said, oh, do, you, do people really feel that way, Gary? And I said, yeah, people really feel that way. They are concerned that you're not paying attention to this. So that, that gives you kind of an update as to where we are. But I am encouraged and um, really ready to, to fight this battle. And again, we have to leave, the DOT has to be very careful on this. And I think you all understand what I'm saying. This is, this is our battle, it is our battle to produce this result. Thanks, Gary. Um, I, I have a question that came in on the chat box from uh, Steve Arnold, and he wanted to know uh, people that would be testifying at the state uh, budget hearings, will there uh, be a three-minute limit? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, just show up and wave while you're at it. Just, you know, just give them a wave for 10 hours. Okay. Uh, I, I am dismayed with this process uh, because... Uh, and I'm happy the governor is doing this. <clears throat> I also want to mention one other thing that I was going to start with. I have a very good friend who retired from the National Guard and another friend who works for FEMA who are in my age group. So they're, they're a little older. Um, and what is impressive here and what I don't understand from the majority party you have a governor who really is about as nonpartisan in his approach, in his demeanor, and, and in the style. So my friend from the National Guard says, Gary, I've worked with every governor back to Warren Knowles, and this governor is the best one I've ever worked with, personally. He doesn't care to be at a ribbon cutting. He doesn't need his picture in the, in the front of our newsletter. He just wants to get the job done. And he said, that's the kind of man I am. And... Uh, then I got word from the FEMA folks on these huge vaccination clinics that he's doing. It's in, uh, they just did one in La Crosse. They're doing one in Eau Claire and Marathon County. Again, these people just want to do their jobs. They want to, they, if the order is given, they want to follow the order. So I'm encouraged that there's a dedication there to the principles that are put forward in the budget. And we certainly have the ability to work with the DOT as these matters move forward. Uh, it's just a very business-like approach. And he and Tommy Thompson are like this. They are, they are hand in glove these days. Uh, so it's very interesting to watch. And Mark, thank you to Steve as well. He was a vital part of the uh, September 30th event where these legislators got on the car. <laughs> One of them said to me, I didn't realize how nice the Amtrak cars actually were, really. You know, I thought, yeah, yes. And it was all socially distanced. Um, and we did, a, we, we, it was really quite an interesting day. John, do you have any comments or words before we go to our next speaker? No, other than to thank uh, Gary for the practical numbers and the practical outlines, because sometimes they're hard to get, but yeah. he actually had them. And uh, I will certainly.